My people, welcome back to your favorite show, You and I Talk Show with Luis Uachu. This week, we have a game changer in the house. Stay tuned. My people, welcome to your favorite show, You and I Talk Show, every week. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to everybody that tunes in. Iman, a guy. Yeah. Am I saying it right? Yes, absolutely right. All right. So thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy. And then you have uh, a very interesting, uh, I want to start by your book. <laughs> Awesome. I didn't think I was going to start by your book, but it's yeah. just that it's, it, it has a, a very catchy uh, title, yeah. The Game Changer, even though I haven't really read it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put a disclaimer ahead of time. <laughs> I haven't really read it, so you know, I'm, I want to say it ahead of time because I really usually just read all the books. Yeah. But what, do people, what can people expect from a book which has as a title? It, it's longer than that, right? Yes, it's actually the game changer, 10 defining moments that change lives. And um, the book technically is on um, the story of 10 people mm -hmm. who went through a, a hardship and how at any point each of them um, kind of decided to, you know, like thought that they are going to give up, they can't continue. And, and there was that turning point in their lives that we call them the defining moment. Mm -hmm. That they suddenly decided to take a different action and change one habit that they were taking before, uh, that they were uh, like doing before. And, and change that one thing and that one thing and that defining moment changed their entire life. Uh -huh. And that's why it's called uh, the game changer, 10 defining moments that change lives. The 10 story defining of 10 moments, people. 10 people. So these are real people, this is non-fiction. Yes, actually, they're real people. Uh, so um, they are actually uh, my students that I was working with them. I, uh, we will get there later on. But uh, it's kind of, um, I was working with them about, you know, why they are passionate to help other people and work with other people. And that's where, um, that's where the stories, uh, they started like talking about their stories. And I was listening to stories and I'm like, it's so wrong that I'm the only person who is hearing these stories, you know? And it's like these stories are really the stories that need to be shared and more people need to uh, read them and, and, and learn from them. And so um, I contacted them and I said, guys, we want to write a book all together. Uh -huh. So we put the book together and yeah, we wow. published it last year. Are they all living in uh, Vancouver? I, I think so. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, uh, I got a, Think about it because we our, our business is entirely online. So mm -hmm. I guess I guess mostly they are in Vancouver area, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. somewhere. Nice. So is this uh, in the Success Road Academy? Yes. Um, because I know that you are also one of the founder of the Success Road Academy, which is the one of the largest information marketing academies in the world. Yes. So I'm the, uh, yes, I'm actually the founder, not one of the founders, but uh, yes, so, um, so yeah, so um, this, uh, it's an academy that we uh, help people to uh, share their message and help people to change their lives. So that's actually one of the things that I want to do. And uh, I, I have a very good marketing knowledge but I was thinking, how can I use my marketing knowledge to create a ripple effect in the world to make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. And I thought I can use that to help other people who want to make a positive difference in other people's lives to share their message more. So that way, if I help 100 people and they go out and help 100 more people, then I've helped 10,000 people. And that's the ripple effect that I'm creating. Uh -huh, so uh -huh, uh -huh. that was the idea. Yeah. And um, so that's when I started the Success Road Academy. And uh, it resonated with people. There are a lot of people who want to make a positive difference in other people's lives, but they don't know how to share their message. They don't know what tools they need to use to share their message. And um, that's what we teach at Success Road Academy. So is this because you yourself had your own message and you didn't have uh, somebody to help you share it? Uh, it's actually, um, it, it actually ended up the other way. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I learned marketing first uh -huh. and I was good at marketing, but then I had a life-changing moment. 
and um, in that life-changing moment, everything um, changed for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I asked myself, how would I be remembered? And the answer to that was, I, I didn't like how I would be remembered in the world. And right. when I came from there, then that was the time that I changed. Okay, we're just going to take a short break and then get into the juice of that subject. Awesome. <laughs> You and I talk show with Louise Wachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uwachu.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we are back. So you were saying, you got into a life-changing moment, and then that's what uh, inspired you. So you also talk about regrets, the things, the people that regret, and then you actually have uh, an upcoming talk with the TEDx uh, people in Vancouver where you're talking about regrets and deathbed lessons. Yeah. So what was your moment then? Yeah, so it's actually in... Um October 2010, one morning I woke up and I was bleeding internally, mm -hmm. um, out of the blue, like just like I was bleeding. And um, and two days later, how do later, you even know that you? How oh, do you? you know, and and uh, you go to washroom and you are bleeding and just kind of like um, really not a good scene. But uh, uh, so I went to the doctor and they said, you know, um, if you felt bad, go to the hospital. Uh -huh. Two days later, I was admitted in the emergency room at the hospital, and they, um, when when they um, got my blood sample and everything, they realized I've lost 60% of my blood, and uh, in about in about three days, and um, and at that point, when a person loses 60% of the blood, left with 40%, um, the person is actually at the at the high risk of getting a fatal heart attack at any moment. And the problem was that they didn't know if I'm still bleeding or not. So um, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know if they need to do a surgery on me to stop the bleeding. Because if I wasn't bleeding, then doing a surgery on a person who only has 40% blood left is actually very risky. So it actually can kill the person. Yeah. And, and they didn't know if they should do the surgery or they should start with the blood transfusion. But the problem with the blood transfusion is that if I was bleeding, then it would be useless of doing the blood transfusion. So anyhow, that's like point, you're putting in it while it's going out. Exactly. So they were like, OK. And, and they were going through this um, situation. And at one point, they are like, OK, you know what? We are just going to take our risk. And, and you have to decide between the two. And both of them can kill you. And, and uh, we should just tell you right away, if you decide to go with blood transfusion, we are going to give you five bags of blood, which every bag of blood can have its own complications. And, and that can be actually fatal. Uh -huh. And if, I, if you do the surgery on you, again, it's going to be fatal. Uh -huh. And if we don't touch you, it can be again fatal. So you have so, to choose between death and death and, and death. death. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just take your chances with yeah. how you want to die. Yeah. Um, oh, so, no. so I said, you know, I just go with the blood transfusion, I guess. Yeah. Right? So um, that's what they started. And they started with the first uh, bag. And I'm sitting there and uh, thinking I'm not going to see tomorrow. So, um, and, and my wife was there and I'm lying down. How old are you at this uh, I stage? Was, I, was, um, I was actually, it was about uh, 10 well, days. Because you look young, you know, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I was actually 10 days before my 27th birthday. Oh, so young. Uh, yeah, so, um, so I'm sitting there and just like looking around and I know that my wife is extremely worried and I don't know what's going to happen, right? And, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, it's, it's the last moments of your life potentially. And um, every bag of blood that is coming is actually can turn it to closer to become the last moment, but it also can change the world and, and you know, like you can continue. You, you don't like, they don't know which one is going to happen. So, um, so yeah, so at that point, I asked myself, I said, like, if you die today, what would you regret? Mm -hmm. And um, I had too many things that I would regret. Yeah. 
Yeah, there were like so many things I would regret in my life I couldn't even imagine. Like I would regret not spending enough time with my wife. I would regret not spending enough time on the things that I really cared about and things that really mattered to me. Um, I, was, I was a good business owner. I always had a good business, right? But then, but then at that point, I'm like, this is, but, but would you really not regret the time that you were spending all of it in your business and mm -hmm. work and mm -hmm. like, yes, maybe it looks good, but, but you know what, the thing is that you didn't pay attention to the things that you really cared about. Uh -huh. and, and that was a point that it really hit me hard. Wow. That I have way too many things yeah. that I'm gonna regret yeah. if, if, I, if I died that day. Wow, so this is what you say that you don't want people to get that far. Because you say that uh, most people, nine out of 10 people on their deathbed, they're regretting their lives. Actually 19 out of 20. Ooh. Yes. So there's only like half a person. <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> who is yeah, on one... his deathbed thinking, you know, I did all right. Yeah, yeah. Five oh, percent of five percent of people on their deathbed, um, they they say like, you know, I, I lived an okay life and I'm, I, I don't have any big regrets. Yeah. But unfortunately, 19 out of 20 people uh, have a massive regret in their lives and they take it all the way to their deathbed. Mm -hmm. And and these regrets come from our, um, our, many of them actually come from our own bad habits, mm -hmm. come from not knowing what we really care about, or many times we even know what we care about, but we don't pay attention to them every single day on a regular basis. So when we are making a decision, we don't bring up our top values and think, what is my number one value? Like for example, if your number one value is health, mm -hmm. if your number one value is family, Every decision that you're making every day can affect those values. And are you really making decisions based on your top values or are you just making decisions because you are reacting to life? Wow, okay, we're gonna take a short break and come back to it. Are you even conscious that you are making decisions? You and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uwacha.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back. So the purpose here is to make sure that none of us, none of you and I, have regrets by the time we die. So what are the three things? Because you say you have three things mm -hmm. that are really key in uh, most people's life. What are those uh, things? It, it really depends on every person. Mm -hmm. You know, every person has different, uh, different values, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I usually say top four, uh, top four values and things that you really care about in your life and have a list of them. Um, I personally like have top 10 for myself, right? It's like, what are the top 10? But really, you have to spend a lot of time and thinking about it. But here is, here is the key. Mm -hmm. Usually in a good day, when you, when you write what you really care about the most, you make a regular list. And you look at it and you're like, it looks good. But then when you do this on your deathbed, it has a whole different meaning to you. And the difference is that on your deathbed, you know that there is no tomorrow. When we, are not, when, we are, when we don't have that experience, we are like, oh, I have tomorrow to pay attention to this thing, yes. so I want to care about this other thing, yes. right? But the way that I usually say is think about it this way. If you were to lose everything, everything you have, your money, your security, your life, your family, your health, like your dignity, your sincerity, like everything that you have. Mm -hmm. If you were to lose everything that you have, what would be the one thing that you would want to keep? Or what would be the one thing that if you had lost, you wouldn't care about anything else? Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. So some people say, for example, for me, it uh -huh. was health. Uh -huh. When I was on my deathbed, uh -huh. I realized I always talk about my family. It's like my family is always the first thing. But when I was on my deathbed, I realized if I don't have my health, I can't be there for my family. Yeah. 
Can it be something like, I would never want to lose my sense of humor because it, the idea of laughing about everything is what keeps me alive. Yes, absolutely. And that's the thing. Like for every person, uh -huh. it's a different thing, right? Uh -huh. So one person may say, you know, I don't care if I'm lying down or if my body doesn't work, uh -huh. but as long as I have my sense of humor, I'm happy. For that person is that. Right? Mm -hmm. And then, so this, what is the second thing? Mm -hmm. If you had your sense of humor, mm -hmm. what is the second thing that you would care about? Uh -huh. And what's the third thing? Uh -huh. What's the fourth thing? Uh -huh. And when you have a list of your top four values and the top four things that you really care about the most, uh -huh. whenever you are making a decision, you can make your decision based on those values. So you are choosing a job. Is it going to be aligned with your first most important thing. Yes, is, is, it it a, a is it a job that's gonna allow you to be funny? Exactly, <laughs> right? Exactly. Or is it a job that's gonna be like, don't bring that laughter up in here? Exactly, right? <laughs> so, so that way, when you know what are the things that you really care about the most, uh -huh. and you follow that, uh -huh. Then that's when you then you are making decisions every day based on what you care about, but not based on reacting to life. We are so used to reacting to life. So now, did you get out of that bed because obviously you survived it? Yes. Did you get out of it and then say, uh, "I'm not going to do my business anymore"? Like how? What was the transformation now? Yes. And then so, how did you get to here? And then were you speaking before, or is this why now you became a speaker and a teacher about it? So, so actually that's the thing. Like after I went through the first question and I was going through more bags of blood, right? Um, the time passed and I started asking myself a second question. And that was the, that was a question that changed my life. I, you know, in my mind, I started um, reading my own obituary for myself. I was like, this is how I would talk about myself if I died today. And this is how people would remember me if I die today. And I really was sad about how people would remember me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was the thing that changed my life. I said, people would remember you as a kind person, as a person who would always be there to support others. But they're not going to remember you because of the impact that you had in the world. And I asked myself, what's my impact in this world? And that was the point that I realized I don't like my impact. I don't like the way that I'm changing other people's lives. I'm not, I don't like the way that I'm helping other people. I'm, I'm, too small for the potential that I have. Mm -hmm. and, and the more time passed, I started thinking about how I would want to be remembered. Nice. And the reason I was thinking about that was because I was thinking, how would I want to change my life? Mm -hmm. And when we realized that actually the, the fifth bag of blood was in and they were like, okay, you know, you survived it. Yeah. It's like, okay, it's a new day, you saw the morning. And, and, and when I got to that point, I said, if you survive the hospital, <laughs> because they wouldn't allow me even to leave the hospital, I wanted actually to leave the hospital at one point, but yeah. then they were like, okay, you're, you're gonna stay here for, for the next 10 days. Yeah. And at that point I was like, what would you change in your life? Yeah. What would you change in your life tomorrow? And that was when I started the change. So. One of the things that I always wanted to be a public speaker, right? In 2007, I set, my, I set a goal for myself to be an international professional public speaker. Yeah. I didn't know what I want to talk about. Yeah. I didn't know what my message is. I didn't know any of that. I just knew that I want to be a public speaker. But, um, but when we immigrated to Canada in 2009 and in that, at that point in 2010, I was running a, a web design and SEO business, which was giving me some financial security but the impact of that wasn't what I wanted in my life. All right. Let's go to a short break and then keep an end on that one. <laughs> you and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uachu.com to be a guest on the show.
Thank you for being here, my people. And we are still talking to Iman Agai. Yes. So where are you originally from? Because you obviously coming from uh, to Canada from... Yes, I'm coming from Iran. Iran. Yes. Chetori. I'm good. <laughs> okay, you talk for and I'm going to talk in English. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So all this happened in Iran? No, this happened here in Canada. Okay, this happened here in Canada. Yeah, I immigrated to Canada in 2009, mm -hmm. and that happened in October 2010. Oh, wow. So we were here. Yes. So when they're giving you the five... Uh, packs of blood. Yes. Is this coming from five different people? Uh, I, I don't know, but it's coming from the uh, uh, blood bank. So yeah. it's coming from different people, processed, uh -huh. and lots of other things. Uh -huh. So yes. Does that kind of affect you and change you? Is that part of what makes you think, okay, I've been helped by, you know, or oh, that doesn't come into... It, you know, actually, I had never thought about it that way. But but yes, I was actually very grateful after that. And, you know, I, w I wanted to give back, actually, in terms of, uh, my, like, blood when I was actually healthier. And uh, But they don't accept my blood, unfortunately, at this point. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> you know, and, but yeah, but it, yes, um, there is a gratefulness for that. And every time I'm actually driving and listening to the ads from the radio that says, you know, it takes 50 people to save a person from an accident, um, uh, from like for blood, mm -hmm. um, I, I really feel like it's it's actually a very important thing, you know, mm -hmm, to donate mm -hmm. blood. And, but yeah, but that's um, but yeah, but anyhow, that's a that's yeah. a. But but in terms of giving back, yeah, it actually more started from me from the point of my impact. Your impact. So you're thinking, okay, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business person, but I am not really making the impact that I would love to make. So I'm going to go there and be a speaker. Now, speaking is like the number one fear. I've, I've read about this. Number one fear of everybody in the world, every culture. You tell somebody to stand up and give a speech, they'll be like, please, kill me. Give me five sacks of blood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking you went through that, so you were like, I can now speak? Or <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing. Like, speaking actually is the second uh, biggest fear of people, and the what's, first what's fear the first is death. One? Oh, oh, see. Right? <laughs> so when you go through, when you yeah. go through the fact that yeah. you're, okay, that's I, I just experienced being on my deathbed. Yeah. Okay, and that's the difference, and that's that's the thing. Like. You know, uh, one of the things is that we change. The, the reason that we don't want to change is because with change comes a loss, okay? Whenever we want to change something in our life, we feel that we're gonna lose something. And that's why we don't want the change. But for a person who just experienced losing everything they had, then there is then they lose the fear of losing. Mm -hmm. And when you lose the fear of losing, then you're not afraid of change because change doesn't come with the loss anymore because you don't care about the loss. You're starting from scratch. You sort of exactly. have nothing to lose anymore. Exactly, right? And you don't have that fear. And so when you don't have that fear, you change. And the reality is that when, when you know, I said, okay, I'm going to get on the stage and I'm going to do this, I'm like, okay, I don't have any fear of losing anymore. Yeah. You know? So, so that's the thing. Like, now, don't uh, get me wrong. I used to be a public speaker, but not in the size that I did afterward and not in the mass amounts. And like, like I, I used to travel across uh, the country to uh, deliver over 200 talks after that. Like yeah. in 2014, I was delivering 200 talks wow. in a year. So, yeah. so that's, you know, like I went from being a person who was always in the office to be always on the stage and constantly sharing and sharing and sharing and and you know and that's that's the that's the difference and that that's the impact and so is this uh, when you won the 
top 25 immigrants in Canada awards. Yes. Like all, all over Canada, you're like the top 25 immigrants. Yes. You're so. like, when people are applying to come to Canada right now, they're like, hey, be like Iman. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I actually won uh, top 25 immigrants in Canada in 2012. Mm -hmm. And as as the result of the changes that I made, and, and the changes that I made, they started uh, um, affecting people in a positive way. And, um, the top 25 immigrants in Canada is actually for any person who has immigrated in Canada, even if they were one year old when they immigrated and they are 65 right now, they can still win the top 25 immigrants in Canada award. So it's like even if, uh, you don't need to be a newcomer at any point of your life. So actually many people who won the award that year with me mm -hmm. are people who have been here 35, 50 years oh, and you know, I still have, have a very, chance. very successful. <laughs> yes. And, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's based on the votes of people and you go, and so there is a jury chose top 75 and then people vote between the top 75, they choose the top 25. And then there is another jury that chooses the top 25 and like confirms the top 25. So yes, and that was in 2012 and that was based on my uh, giving back to the community of entrepreneurs and business owners and helping them with sharing their message. Very nice. So we're coming towards the end of uh, the interview. It's short, but thank you so much for being here. Now you're speaking, let's end uh, with how you're speaking at TEDx uh, this year. Yes. Uh, and you're going to be speaking specifically about the deathbed uh, thing. Yeah, so it's at uh, TEDx Stanley Park. I'm speaking at TEDx Stanley Park, and um, it's gonna be my talk is gonna be about the three lessons that I learned from my deathbed and how it impacted my life and how people can actually learn those lessons without being on their deathbed. Yes. <laughs> Which is actually a better idea, believe me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of like they can learn those lessons, yeah. change their lives, change the habits that is affecting their lives in a negative way, and, and make, a, make a bigger impact in this world and help other people to live a better life at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's what people should retain. Like, don't wait to be on your deathbed then to start being like, oh, I should have done this and this and that. It would be nice if people already started processing exactly. the whole thing. Wow, so people see an impact in your life. I mean, it's, your wife is very happy with this, I suppose. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, yeah. Iman, thank you so much for being here. My people, thank you so much for being here every week. That's it for today. Have a great weekend. <laughs>